money was no object, two of the brands most likely to be at the top of your wish list are Intense and Santa Cruz. Based only 400 miles apart, these two Californian rivals have been battling for our hearts and wallets for decades. And that battle has only, well, intensified with the introduction of their two latest trail bikes, the Intense Primer and the Santa Cruz Hightower. Closely matched in almost every facet, these two boutique trail bikes both boast 140 millimeters of rear wheel travel, 150 mil forks up front, and full carbon frames. They both come with flip chips for adjusting the geometry, internal cable routing, threaded bottom brackets, grease port pivot lubrication, and usable bottle cage mounts. They even share the same counter-rotating link suspension design, even if it's labeled VPP on the Santa Cruz and JS tuned on the Intense. Where the two diverge is on price. While the Santa Cruz is sold through dealers, the Intense is sold direct to the public. This allows the Intense Primer to undercut the Santa Cruz Hightower by a thousand pounds. Now considering how close everything else is on paper, this should allow the Intense Primer to walk this test. Well, let's go and find out. Until recently, Intense's trail bike range took a scattergun approach with five different models to choose from. For 2020 though, it zeroed its sights, and focused on one model, the new Intense Primer. That said, this new chassis is offered in several configurations. Choose from either 29 inch or 27.5 inch wheels, or a combination of the two in the shape of the intriguing Primer S mullet bike. In its previous guise, the featherweight primer was scalpel sharp with a hair trigger response and the ability to make you feel both 10 years younger and 10 miles per hour faster. The revised model is much sturdier with a stiffer swing arm, an additional 10 millimeters of travel, a chunkier frame and reworked linkage that changes the suspension characteristics. Designed by Cesar Rojo's Barcelona based studio, the new primer retains the sharp lines of the old bike, but adds some modern touches, including the hidden upper link pivot, the seamless seat clamp design, and the integrated rubber frame protection. While certain elements of the geometry have evolved, such as the two degree slacker head angle, others haven't. The reach on our size large frame is only six millimeter longer than its predecessor, and the seat angle has got slacker. The Kashima coated Fox suspension is top of the range, but the 34 fork leaves the front end looking anemic. Fox doesn't usually offer the 34 with more than 140 millimeters of travel, which means Intense has specifically chosen to go beyond that limit. And the consequence is a lack of stiffness. This makes it hard to place the bike with complete confidence or trust the steering when pushing hard. A much better choice would have been to fit the Fox 36 that's found on the Primer S mullet bike to the entire range. At the back, the float DPX2 shock can be run in two different positions, which allows you to change the head angle by 0.6 degrees and the bottom bracket height by eight millimeters. Swapping between the two is easy and the hardware is chunky, so there's less chance of losing vital bits by the trail side. Intense has opted for a mix and match approach to the components. While the SRAM drivetrain worked reliably during our test, the Shimano XT brake suffered from a constantly shifting bike point. Compared to the Hightower, the Intense Primer has a long seat tube and a short dropper post. In fact, there's 20 millimeter difference between the two bikes. And this really hampers how aggressively you can ride it on steep descents and rough terrain. It also restricts the potential for moving up a frame size. Initially, we set the Primer up with 30% sag, but the bike would drop too easily into the mid-stroke and we could never get anywhere near full travel. The reason for this is a combination of the end stroke progression from the linkage and the large volume spacer inside the shock. Intense says this is because it wanted the primer to ride high in the travel and feel responsive under power. Now that's all well and good, but then you just end up riding around with a load of travel that you can't use. To increase the operating window, we tried various smaller volume spacers, eventually setting on a 0.6 inch instead of the stock 0.9 inch. This allowed us to get full travel with our sag at 30%, but the first half of the stroke was still used up in the blink of an eye, 
and then would start to hit a wall towards the bottom out. To help generate some support in the mid-stroke, we added lots of low-speed compression damping. It worked to a degree, but the side effect was increased harshness. On technical climbs, the lack of mid-stroke support combined with a low bottom bracket meant that we regularly used the compression lever to avoid striking pedals. Fortunately, the shock position under the top tube means it's always within easy reach. So this new primer would suit a more traditional diet of trail centre single track, where long gradual climbs mix with flowing descents and you never have to be that dynamic on the bike. Where it begins to miss the mark are on bike park influenced trails where you really load up the suspension into corners and jumps, as well as rough challenging downhills because the suspension doesn't feel consistent and the front end lacks precision. So for a brand new platform, it still has one foot in the past and some of the spec choices are confused. That said, if price is your bottom line, it's a grand cheaper than the Hightower CC X01 and even the fully loaded top of the range Primer Elite with carbon wheels still manages to undercut the Santa Cruz by 100 pounds. Before this version 2 came out, the Hightower used a similar frame layout to the Primer, with the shock driven by a short swing link beneath the top tube. That's all changed now, with almost the entire Santa Cruz range using the lower link driven VPP arrangement first introduced on the V10 downhill bike. Simply put, by using the lower link to drive the shock, the leverage rate is kept more consistent throughout the stroke and this makes it easier to tune the shock and set up the suspension. To accommodate the shock, the frame uses a pierced seat tube design, where the RockShox Super Deluxe shock passes through a moulded tunnel and anchors to the base of the down tube. There's enough room to run a bottle cage within the main triangle, but it's much more difficult to reach the compression threshold lever when climbing, and it's also quite difficult to see the O-ring when you're trying to set up the sag. Getting the Lyric Fork set up is simple. We ran around 10% more air pressure than recommended by the chart printed on the left leg, with the rebound almost wide open and added a couple of clicks of low speed compression damping. It's the same story with the shock. We found our recommended air pressures on the Santa Cruz website, set the sag and the damping, and we didn't touch the shock again for the entire duration of the test. Like Intense, Santa Cruz uses a flip chip at the rear shock mount to let you tune the geometry and the suspension feel. This one only has around half as much effect though, and it is fiddly to access. The full SRAM spec on the Hightower CC X01 might seem run of the mill, but it works. The code brakes have a little less initial bite and a firmer spring than the XT models fitted to the Intense, but they stop just as well without any consistency issues. Shifting was precise and the dinky 30 tooth chainring eased the strain on grinder climbs. Scattered around the bike are a selection of details that show just how much thought has gone into the design of the high tower. There's a small mudguard to protect the shock from dirt. There are bearings in the rear shock eyelet to reduce friction. The Palmdale grips and the Maxxis Minion DHR2 tires are excellent and oversized torque caps fitted to the DT front hub maximize steering stiffness. The Santa Cruz Hightower is just one of those bikes that gets on with a job in hand and delivers results without fuss or fanfare. It manages to entice and excite at every turn, and the more we rode it, the more we appreciated its abilities. First, the climbs. Although the actual seat angle is slacker than the intense, the effective seat angle at our maximum saddle height is two degrees steeper, so you sit further forward over the bottom bracket. Allied to the supportive suspension means that it's more efficient when pedaling. There's more stability too, so unless you want to mash away out of the saddle, there's no need to stretch down for that compression lever. Tip into a descent, no matter what gradient, and the high tower instantly feels predictable and engaging. You can lean it in at Moto GP angles and load up both tires for carving turns or push into the travel to generate speed or pop to clear obstacles. Wherever you are in the stroke, it feels consistent, so you never have to second guess what the suspension is doing. And that leaves you headroom to concentrate on pushing harder, 
breaking later or trying to hit more challenging lines. And there's more leg room too, because that saddle drops completely out of the way. So you can be much more dynamic than on the Intense without getting tangled up. So much so that we could easily move up to an XL frame and still run a 170 mil dropper with adequate standover clearance. The new Santa Cruz High Tower is alert, rewarding, inspiring and refined. All of the things you'd hope for at this price point. In fact, it's almost impossible to find a chink in its armour. Previous complaints, such as the US biased cable routing, have finally been fixed on this latest model. And Santa Cruz has even made the rear centre longer on the XXL frame so that taller riders won't get left hanging off the back of the bike. It feels right from the very first pedal stroke and encapsulates the versatility that defines every great trail bike. That two bikes can be so similar on paper, yet so different in ride quality and performance, just goes to show how you can't judge a bike by its spec sheet. Despite being launched a couple of months before the Santa Cruz, the Intense Primer actually looks and rides like it's much older. While the frame is certainly sturdier than its predecessor, the fork has been overstretched for this application and feels spindly when loaded up. Out of the box, the JS tuned suspension feels less resolved. It falls too easily into the sag position and then ramps up so aggressively we couldn't get anywhere near full travel. Switching volume spaces definitely helped the situation, but we were still left with a frustrating mid stroke hammock. Ironically, a lack of mid stroke support was always a criticism of the old upper link driven Santa Cruz bikes. And while the new shock designs with increased negative spring volumes have helped mitigate the problem, Santa Cruz only really fixed it when it moved to the lower link driven design. Even if the suspension was perfect, the sizing on the Intense is somewhat conservative and the lanky seat tube means it's much more difficult to upsize to a larger frame. So for a brand new bike, the Intense Primer already feels outdated in places. Yes, the financial savings over a similarly equipped high tower are tempting, but if you ride hard on progressive trails, the primer is always going to feel compromised. Santa Cruz has come a long way in the last few years. While it's always been an exclusive, aspirational brand, its bikes were regularly underwhelming. The sizing was ultra conservative and the suspension never really delivered the magic carpet ride that matched the price tag. Now though, bikes like the Hightower deliver the performance to back up the image. Adopting the lower link suspension design has done wonders for the performance. And from the very first pedal stroke, it feels like you can ride the Hightower to your absolute limits and beyond. With five frame sizes and up to 518 millimeter reach, getting the perfect fit is simple. And it's made even easier by the impressive standover heights found throughout the range. The components are well chosen and the shock is perfectly tuned. So with that lifetime warranty tucked in your back pocket, you can really focus 100% on riding hard and having a blast. So I hope you enjoyed this head-to-head -head test and do let us know in the comments below which of these two bikes you'd like to take home.